Hi, after watching the video, click the link in the description to download the program. Mother pressed her lips against his forehead, and he was burning up. After he became unconscious, they knew their boy only had a few hours left. He desperately needed an antibiotic and something to bring his fever down. But a few months into the Great Depression, most American families had run out of medication. So his father rushed into the backyard desperately looking for a special kind of plant, one that has been used for generations long before penicillin was invented. Today, nobody knows about this lost skill, but I'm sure you'll recognize the plant because it's spread all over America and Canada. If tomorrow all the pharmacies ran dry and you didn't have any other way to fight an infection, knowing this one plant would be a godsend, and I'll tell you more about it in just a moment. But first, let me tell you why I'm even talking to you here today. That little boy was my father. If my grandfather hadn't known about this special plant, the infection would have surely claimed his son's life that very night. He made a tea from the plant. Then he cut the inner bark of a willow tree and made an infusion out of it. If you ever get a high fever, inflammation, or any kind of pain, just try it. It acts like a very powerful aspirin with enhanced pain-killing effects. In fact, the most important ingredient in aspirin is called salicylic acid, and it comes from the Latin word for willow tree or salix. Now, you wouldn't think it, but our forefathers knew that you can also use it to preserve your canned goods from toxic bacteria. In just 30 minutes, my grandfather's combined remedies brought the hellish fever down to 100, and in one short week, the infection was gone. His healing wisdom saved not only my father's life, but countless others as well over the next few decades. And today I'm going to share with you this lost knowledge of medicinal plants and remedies. I'm talking about common plants that can replace modern antibiotics like backyard weeds that can numb your pain just like morphine, and plants that can stop your bleeding in just minutes, even plants that work better than most modern drugs to reverse joint damage and arthritis, lower your cholesterol, stabilize your blood sugar levels, and even prevent cancer from developing in your body. Now, most importantly, these plants will keep you healthy during the worst of times. When the next deadly crisis hits America, you can be sure that life-saving meds will be the first to vanish off the shelves. Your only hope is to treat yourself without them, so your backyard plants and common weeds can become your own medicine cabinet, and most of them are also edible and will keep you and your loved ones well-fed while other people will be cooking their leather shoes and belts. And let me tell you, when you haven't eaten for days and your immune system is at its weakest, it doesn't take much to put you in an early grave. That's exactly what happened to most families during the Great Depression, when it wasn't food shortages that claimed the most lives like you might expect, it was disease. People would wither and die from common colds and infections in their own homes, and many were discovered like that by their neighbors with food supplies intact. What you're about to hear is a true American story stretching over 100 years and three generations of my family. It's something I've given a lot of thought to about sharing or not, as what I'm about to reveal is deeply personal. And I'm only doing it because this information will end up saving many American lives and it could save yours as well. As a young boy, my grandfather came to America alone at the turn of the century with nothing but the clothes on his back. But when he left this world, more than 5,000 people from all over the world came to his funeral. Our small town of Springfield didn't have enough hotels to accommodate them, so everybody offered a place to stay. And while I didn't know most of them, they all knew my grandfather. And believe it or not, you know my grandfather too. You know him because you know his generation the greatest generation. If you knew one of them, you knew all of them. It was a generation shaped by hardships and turmoil that others after them would never face again. It was a generation that had to mature fast in order to survive the Great Depression and then fight in World War II. They were willing to serve and sacrifice for the greater good. Growing up on his ranch, he would sit me down on his lap and tell me about the hard times he faced when he was my age. My grandfather became an orphan when he was just seven years old. He was saved by a Native American woman. Ayanna found him thin as a rake eating pokeweed fruits in the woods, which are poisonous if you don't know how to cook them. My grandfather stayed in a coma for a few weeks while the medicine man was treating him. Some healing plants and a healthy dose of activated charcoal brought him back from the brink of death. 
Ayanna soon took a liking to him, and because he had no relatives left alive, she decided to raise him as her own. And my grandfather recalled this time of growing up so close to nature and enjoying the happiness of a simple life as one of the best times in his life. He'd go out with Ayanna everywhere, and most of the time they'd forage for edible and medicinal plants in the woods. One of Ayanna's duties was to find these plants and bring them to the medicine man. My grandfather could soon name and recognize more than 100 plants, then 200. And before his 18th birthday, he knew around 500 edible and medicinal plants. He knew where to find them, when to harvest them, and how to turn them into powerful remedies just like his adoptive mother. By the beginning of World War II, his remedies were so famous that desperate people from other states came to seek him out. Now, my grandfather was a pacifist, but he was also a patriot. He enlisted in the army not to kill, but to save as many lives as possible. If you'd been on the muddy battlefield of Petier, you'd have seen 600 brave American soldiers carrying their backpacks and one who was carrying two. That was my grandfather, who brought his remedies with him. They converted a deserted French church into a makeshift hospital, and by nightfall it was all full of hundreds of wounded young Americans. When the surgeons ran out of morphine, it was my grandfather who gave them relief. He had with him a powerful pain-killing extract made from this plant. Now, I'm sure you've seen it in your backyard, too, just as my grandfather taught me. I'll show you today how to make it so you never have to worry about running out of painkillers. My grandfather would rush from soldier to soldier and bring a small vial of the extract to their lips. In minutes, the loud groans and cries would subside to the amazement of all the army surgeons who had not seen anything like it before. And he wasn't a medic, but after seeing how well his remedies worked, they let him do his job. With mortar shells and shrapnel flying all around him, he'd plunge himself into the midst of battle and pull men to safety, stop their bleeding, disinfect their wounds, and ease their pain. And by the end of the war, every man in the 8th Infantry Division knew him as Dr. Davis. And since then, that's what people called him. Back home in America, my grandfather never did get a medal for all his efforts, although he probably saved just as many lives as the surgeons that he worked with in the fields of Normandy. In the 60s, people from all over the country came seeking my grandfather. Our small farm was filled with the sick from dusk to dawn, and his supply of herbs was barely able to keep up. When I was a boy in the 80s, he would send me out to harvest the many types of plants and weeds he needed for his medicines. And it was one of my favorite activities. He just gave me a simple journal that held drawings and descriptions for every medicinal plant you can imagine. It became my grandfather's lifelong dream to gather all the natural cures and remedies spread all over America. So he talked to mountain men who had cured sickness and treated disease in communities cut off from civilization. He visited medicine men in Native American reservations, the living reservoirs of hundreds of generations of healing tradition. And every now and then, he traveled to the most remote corners of America, reaching as far away as the Alaskan tundra. His plant journal he gave me as a child grew larger and larger, and he began calling it the Lost Book of Old Remedies. At his funeral, an old woman, Mary, told me how she had met my grandfather many years before, he was passing through her small town looking for a plant and heard that a nine-year-old girl was very sick. She had tuberculosis, a disease that almost surely killed you back then. Mary was dying in her mother's arms. I just try to imagine the feeling of helplessness and despair. Unfortunately, this is not a page closed in history. During many crises that came across time, say for example Katrina, antibiotics were the first to go off the shelves and decent people like you and me died from common diseases that could have easily been treated with common plants. Well, anyway, at that time, an antibiotic for tuberculosis hadn't yet been invented, so my grandfather first used this plant. Few Americans know about this graceful weed, and fewer still grow it in their backyard. When the organism is in high stress mode from fighting an infection, this is exactly what you need to bring it to balance and speed up the healing process. Now, the second plant my grandfather used was spotted loco weed, which he always prescribed for shortness of breath and pulmonary infections. After making a concoction out of the two plants, Mary was cured in a few months, which is amazing because nowadays it takes at least six months to treat it using powerful antibiotics. She enjoyed a life that came so close to ending prematurely. 
I never knew her story until she told me, and as I looked around at the thousands gathered there, I realized my grandfather must have had many other stories and that a lot of people were only there thanks to his remedies. Was he able to save everyone no matter how advanced or hard to treat the disease? Of course not. If someone claims that they can treat your cancer with a miracle cure, you can bet that they're crooks trying to take advantage of you. My grandfather was not like that. He genuinely cared about all of his patients and was honest with them from the beginning. He didn't have miracle cures, but real cures. And I'm sure your grandmother had some as well. Maybe not as many as my grandfather, who was a professional healer, did, but she must have had a few time-tested remedies of her own. And when you got sick as a child, they worked just as well, if not better, than drugs. That's the kind of precious knowledge my grandfather tried to save and use for the common good all his life. And let me tell you, my grandfather's funeral was an eye-opening moment for me. The times I spent with him on his ranch in Texas were some of the happiest in my life. And when my grandfather died, he left me three things that I treasure greatly. The best childhood I could ever dream of, the values that made me the man I am today, and a manuscript. But make no mistake, this isn't just any kind of manuscript. It's something that all men and women from coast to coast should know about. It was his plant journal, his book of old remedies, and it began when he was young. My grandfather started writing down all the plants that he was gathering with Iana, and then took notes from the tinctures and concoctions used by the medicine man. He had it with him in the fields of northern France. It's what he used to treat many of our brave men when the antibiotics and pain medications ran out. It's what saved my father's life during the Great Depression when most Americans died from disease, not starvation. And it'll do the same in the next crisis. Even after the war, my grandfather's manuscript healed countless people. Some of them had conditions so severe their own doctors didn't know what to do. They all showed up on our doorstep. Desperate mothers with their children, hopeless seniors plagued by chronic pain, and even bedridden people brought by their relatives. I've seen them all. And my grandfather managed to treat most of them without using any toxic or addictive drugs. He used just what you might have right now in your backyard. Weeds you pass by every day without realizing their true power. This is why I say that this is probably the most precious thing my grandfather left me. I keep it in my medicine cabinet. It'll be there when my family and I need it most. I think it should be in your medicine cabinet as well. And that's why I edited all his manuscripts, so that anyone can take advantage of them. Instead of his drawings, I added real color pictures of the plants so that you can easily identify them. I also replaced his handwriting. At times it was difficult to understand, probably because some of his notes were written in the field and even in the midst of battle. But other than this, I left the information untouched. His manuscripts had stains of American blood from World War II, and I printed those too exactly as I found them. After months of work and spending a great deal of time and money, I had it published. It's called exactly what my grandfather would have wanted. The Lost Book of Remedies. And here's just a glimpse of what you'll find in it. In the first part of my grandfather's The Lost Book of Remedies, you'll find pictures with all the healing plants in North America. For each plant, you'll also learn the little things you need to look for in order to be 100% sure that you've got the right plant and not a look-alike. This part goes extremely in-depth so people with no plant knowledge can use it to its full potential. I gathered medicinal plants for my grandpa when I was just 12, and if I did it back then, be sure you can do it now. With hundreds of healing plants, I knew I had to find a way for people to quickly pinpoint the one they need. So I first grouped them by type and location. And if you're at home, just open the Backyard Weeds chapter to find out what medicines you're growing around your house without even realizing it. For example, I'm sure you've already seen at least one of these so-called useless weeds. Well, my grandfather turned it into the powerful pain-killing extract that he used in World War II. Now, I hope you've never seen a grown man or woman crying in your arms in excruciating pain. So, how would you feel to be the only one from your group or town who can offer relief when people need it most? Now, remember the plant that my grandfather turned into an antibiotic that saved my father's life? 
Imagine when there are no more antibiotics, being able to simply walk out into your backyard to find and identify this plant, a simple weed that will prove to be more valuable in times of need than all your drugs combined. Now, I'm sure you'll also recognize this common driveway weed. Even if you're living in the city, it's kind of hard not to bump into it. What you probably don't know is that it's a powerful anti-inflammatory that's good for wound healing. I'll show you how to make a poultice and how to use it to dress your wounds. Or if you or one of your friends is suffering from an autoimmune disease, you can take this as a remedy immediately. In this huge chapter, you'll find all the other medicinal weeds and backyard plants that are hidden around your house. Now, you've got a homegrown pharmacy you didn't even know about. And most of these plants are edible, especially the three that you've seen, and can provide you with precious nutrients in a crisis. This goes for all the plants you'll find in the Lost Book of Remedies. Not only will you learn what part of the plants are edible, but I'll show you how to cook them the right way. And in the second part, you'll discover how to identify the wild edibles and remedies that grow in forests. If you ever have to go out foraging, will you know which one of these plants is edible, which one is a remedy for high blood pressure and tension, and which one is poisonous? The Native Americans knew all too well, and so did my grandfather. But very few people nowadays know, so don't feel bad if you don't. These kinds of skills will set you apart from your group and will probably turn you into their guide or even savior. Imagine just for a second how it'll feel to be able to be the only doctor for 50 miles. And all thanks to a simple book you had the foresight to get today. I'm sure you've seen this plant too. It grows in most forest glades and you'll discover how to use it to effectively treat not only common colds, but lung infections as well. Also, breathing in the steam from leaves that have been boiled in water will calm any asthma attack. This is why 100 years ago, people with asthma didn't die from it. Now, if you ever walk through the edges of the woodland and get some sticky burrs attached to your clothing, you can bet that you've just passed by this plant. And the best way to deal with this annoying weed? Eat it. Native Americans used it as a sweetener 200 years ago, and it tastes better than all the greens I know. What people don't know is that this plant is a strong diuretic. You can take it for poor blood circulation. If you've ever felt a tingling and numbness sensation in a limb in certain positions, you probably have bad circulation, and you should consider this blood vessel cleanser. I've seen my grandfather's patients go from dizzy and tired most of the time to having an excess of energy in less than three weeks. And in the third part, you'll discover how to identify the wild edibles and remedies that grow most often in the prairie. But most of them are spread all over America, like bone set, which can be easily turned into one of the most powerful antipyretics. This means that it drastically reduces fever. In fact, the name bone set was derived from the plant's use in the treatment of breakbone fever. Now, here's another widespread weed. The folk name of this plant is the cowboy's toilet paper. If you've ever touched its soft leaves, you understand why. If you ever get an infected wound or cut, just apply the Frontier Poultice. And I personally haven't seen a modern bandage that heals wounds faster and better than this. I'll also show you the strange reason why putting a leaf of this plant in your shoes in the morning is as good as a cold shower and coffee. A similar weed called woolly lamb's ear can be added to the frontier poultice to stop bleeding in a matter of seconds. This plant is high in vitamin K, the vitamin that coagulates the blood. It's the powdered vitamin that was given to soldiers in World War II to pour over the wound in case they were shot. My grandfather used it when the bandages ran out and his brothers in arms were bleeding to death. Now, I hope you never find yourself looking down at a wound that just won't stop bleeding, but if you do, be sure the Frontier Poultice is your best shot, other than being in the ICU. And if you or a loved one has diabetes or problems with coagulation or wound healing, make sure that you have this healing cataplasm around your house without delay. No matter where you live in America, there's a source of water nearby. And when there's water, there are cattails. If you find cattails, you'll have everything you need for survival. Water, food, shelter, and fuel. Now, you probably already know cattails are edible, but I doubt you know how tasty they are. I'll show you how I cook them in the field and at home, and how to turn them into flour. 
but probably the most important and least known thing about the cattails is the jelly-like substance that grows between its leaves. My grandfather prescribed it for most severe skin infections, and let me tell you it's nothing short of a miracle. I've seen abscesses the size of a small plate healed in just days. And this gel is also one of the best cures for nail and foot fungus. Now, on a different note, this gel is the only part of the cattail that is widely considered to be inedible. It's not poisonous, so why? Well, because it has a powerful numbing effect on moist tissues and has been used as a Novocaine substitute. Yes, it's an anesthetic that you can use in many, many situations. When the pioneers were hit with a ravaging toothache, they'd just go get their jar of cattail ooze and rub it around their gums, and the pain would subside in minutes. Another part of the Lost Book of Remedies comprises all the medicinal and edible trees in North America. One of the things you'll find here is the ultimate survival tree that grows on almost every street in the U.S. I call it that because you can use the sap as medicine, its flowers as sleeping pills, its leaves as food, and the inner bark as cordage. Now, you don't need much more than this to stay alive, but only a handful of people still know this lost skill. So if you're an old-timer like my grandfather, get ready to use this intelligence for its full potential. Do you recognize this tree? You might have even scraped yourself on one of its thorns as a child. The Native Americans cooked its honey-sweet pods and ate them. The sharp young spines were used as pins, nails, spear points, and animal traps during the Civil War, when the South suffered many shortages. According to a recent medical study at Michigan State University, the flowers of this tree strongly prevent spreading of prostate, breast, colon, and lung tumors. You'll find all these things in the Lost Book of Remedies. Really, there's too much to say here. There are hundreds of plants you'll find in my grandfather's book, and you'll learn how to turn them into powerful cures. Medicines had all originated from plants until companies started making synthetic versions. This forgotten wisdom should be brought back to life, and today is your chance to play a role in doing that by putting the Lost Book of Remedies... Hi. After watching the video, Click the link in the description to download the program.